my very end. You are worthy to be praised, only you, only you, Alpha. You are worthy to you be praised. You are worthy to be praised. Only you. Only you. Only you. Only you. Said Alpha. Alpha. My beginning. Oh. You are worthy to be praised. If only you, only you, only you, only you. to be praised only you Yes, you are. You are worthy of my praises. Today. You are worthy of my praises. You are worthy of my praises today. You are worthy. You are worthy of my praise, oh God. In every situation, Lord, you are worthy of my praises. Today. You are worthy of my praise. You, you are worthy of my praise. Yes, you are. 
From the rising of the sun to its going down Yes you are, you are and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat for whether we live 
we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see my, for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no depth, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. We brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The strife is all. Oh, my God. 
Shall we pray? Eternal Rock of Ages, we want to thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for your mercies. We commit the service unto your hand, Lord. We ask that you take preeminence in the name of Jesus. Lord, let your name and your name be glorified in the name of Jesus. This morning, let life be touched, let souls be saved in the name of Jesus. As we continue, we ask that you continue with us in the name of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. And the living in the house, we say better. Amen.
God of all comfort, the resurrection and the life. We give you all the glory. Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. As we gather in your name, we know your presence is here with us. Come and comfort the family. Come and comfort your church. And let your name be glorified. In Jesus' precious name, we have worship. Amen. Please be seated. Our first Bible reading this morning will be taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 26. Please welcome to take this lesson, Mrs. Kim Duze Hart. Good morning, everyone. Morning, church. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain? Ye, and we have found false witness of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that, the dead raise not. For if the dead raise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ not be raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are, all, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of death. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming, then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the king, kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Amen. Amen. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell. No scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Our next hymn is on page four of our program. Shall we all please rise? <laughs>
second Bible reading will be taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Please welcome to take this lesson, Princess Tolisa Beche. Praise the Lord. Our first our reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 to 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So when my dying breath shall render the veil in twain, by death I shall escape from death and life eternal gain, knowing as I am known. How shall I love that word, and oft repeat before the throne, forever with the Lord. Our next hymn is on page six. Shall we all please rise? <laughs>
wanted to read the biography of her dad, please welcome Dr. Mrs. Omohomo Duze Akonde. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be reading my dad's biography. Um, but before I do so, I'd just like to say that I've come to terms with the fact that no matter how much we try to tell his story, it's, it's really just a summary and it doesn't really capture everything that he stood for but I'm gonna read it anyways. Um, my father passed away on the 18th of January, 2022, at the age of 68. He was a man of honor, intelligence, humor, and compassion. He led a life filled with love and devotion to his family and friends. He was a true disciple of Jesus Christ and a gentleman at all times. He was born on the 1st of November, 1953 in Enugu State. Theo, as he was fondly referred to, was the sixth of nine children and the youngest male child born to the family of Samali Mohammed and Ashatu Alice Ni Abdullahi Duze from Ewu in Edo State. He spent most of his early life in Ibadan where he attended primary school. In 1967, he was admitted to Ahmadiyya Grammar School, now known as Anwar Islam Grammar School for his secondary education. There he excelled academically and served as a senior prefect in 1971. In 1972, he gained admission to study geology at the University of Ife now known as Obafemi Awolowo University, and graduated top of his class in 1977, winning the West African Portland Cement Prize for the best final year student in geology. His time at Great Ife was filled with many fond memories, which he often shared with his family and friends. He completed his National Youth Service Corps in JOS, and worked for a few months at the Nigerian Steel Development Authority in Kaduna. In 1979, he began his career at Elf Petroleum Nigeria Limited, now known as Total Energies EP Nigeria Limited, where he served for over 30 years and rose through the ranks to eventually retire as the General Manager Ventures in March 2010. In November 2010, he set up his own oil and gas consultancy, DMSCL, and in 2014, he became the chairman of Manox Integrated Limited. He distinguished himself and won many awards throughout his career, including the Footprints Leadership Award for Outstanding Leadership Qualities, Professionalism, and Achievement from the Redeemed Christian Church of God, City of David, in 2011 and the America Merit Award for Integrity, sorry, the Africa Merit Award for Integrity, Accountability and Transparency in Leadership from Lead Times Africa Magazine in 2009. He was a fellow of the Nigerian Association of Petroleum Explorationists, NAPE, a member of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, AAPG, Nigerian Institute of Management, AMNIM, Nigerian Mining and Geosciences Society, NMGS, and the Council of Nigerian Mining Engineers and Geoscientists, COMEG. Those who worked with him spoke of his honesty and integrity. He never bent the rules or told a lie to favor anyone, including himself. He was very meticulous 
He had, his attention to detail and record keeping was second to none. He could be trusted without a doubt to deliver on any task, any task handled, to deliver on any task he handled and was a reliable friend and confidant to many. He was married to Maureen Duzé, the love of his life, whom he met in Toulouse, France in the summer of 1981. He would fondly recall the first day he set eyes on her, saying he knew there was something different about her. She was bright and colorful. She lit up his world. He was determined to get to know her and did not mince his words. This was the beginning of a lifelong friendship, romance and adventure to which he gave his complete devotion. He excelled as a husband and abided by the principle, happy wife, happy life. Theo and Maureen were a match made in heaven, complimentary in every way. He was the true Ephesians 2.25 husband who loved his wife dearly till the end. Together they raised five lovely children, guided by the principles of the word of God. My father led by his example of honesty, loyalty, and authenticity as he raised his children. He was always there for us. His arms were always open, his ears ever ready to listen. He was always full of sound counsel. He did not spare a penny in ensuring the welfare of his family. He was open about every area of his life and used his failures as lessons to encourage, rep remand, and instruct his children. Right from when his children were young, he would seek out their opinion on various matters and gave them a voice in the home. This was deliberate, especially toward his daughters, myself and my sisters, because he firmly believed that women are valuable and should be accorded respect even as young girls. He was not only the father, of, the father to his biological children, he had many adopted sons and daughters whom he loved and mentored like his own. He shared openly with his sons-in-laws, whom he loved dearly, and always gave unbiased advice on matters brought to his attention. He really was a gentle giant. His presence was always reassuring, never obtrusive. He was dependable through the years and over generations. My dad was a foodie. He loved his wife's cooking. Her famous akara and ogi, which he enjoyed on Saturday mornings with his grandchildren. He loved music and a good dance, especially when there was food involved. He loved a good joke and was good at telling them and teasing, especially those close to him. He was a car enthusiast and an avid reader. He also enjoyed long distance drives, exploring new places and playing board games with family. In his last days, he, developed, he displayed exceptional strength of character, positivity, selflessness, and courage. In his own words, he was an old soldier in modern times, standing strong as ever. On his last birthday in November 2021, surrounded by family and close friends, he expressed profound gratitude for the life he had lived and gave glory to God. He passed away two months after. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. To give a tribute this morning to Mr. Theo Duze, please welcome Pastor Itwa Igodalo, Senior Pastor of Trinity House. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. My dear sister Maureen and the rest of the children, my heart deeply goes out to you. 
And I'm sure that you know that I know how you feel. This morning, as I took my children to school, it was my daughter's, I don't know, athletic meeting, sports day. And I was taking her to school to drop her off for the sports day. He started to shower very gently, started to shower very gently. And my daughter turned to me and said, oh, daddy, not on a day like this. And as I saw the showers, and I remember Theodore Duze, I said to myself, Theodore, Theobald was a great man. Theobald was a great man. Anytime a great person passes, the Lord opens the windows and sends gentle showers. Sometimes a big storm, depending on how the heavens feel. My wife died one year, seven months ago, almost to the day. The day we buried her, as we put her into the grave, the heavens opened and there was a torrent of rain. And the heavens said she was a great lady. And when I saw those showers, I said, your husband was a great man. He will live forever in our hearts and the hearts of those of us who were privileged to share part of his life. I can't remember exactly when we met, but you were reminding me when I came to the house that you all were in City of David when it was at the lagoon. And you do remember me from that time. But along the line, I was invited to join a company called Manox Integrated Limited, established by one of the leading members of our church, a guy called Michael Ego, who works in the petroleum industry. And he was putting this company together, and he wanted a crop of very capable, very strong, very dependable, very honest, very sincere, and very Christian people on his board. He therefore chose me and chose your husband. And when it was time to elect a chairman, the outstanding choice was Theobald Duzier. Your husband, your father, was a gentleman, distinguished, quiet, humble. His humility took the breath out of me. He was a team player listen to everyone's opinions. He was patient. He led by example. The journeys to Abuja, John is here, and he will volunteer to go when most people were reluctant to go for one reason or the other. He was extremely knowledgeable about the oil and gas industry, and he lent himself to many things. On the board of Manox Integrated, we will miss him very, very greatly. We will miss his leadership. We will miss his kindness. We will miss his love for God. He was a true Christian. That I can avow to. And one of the most painful things that I've experienced this year was my inability to see him as much as I tried just before the end. May the Lord comfort you all. May the Lord strengthen you. Kim, Mozi, Omo, Jide, Victor, my heart goes out to you. God bless you all. Hallelujah. When all strength is gone, when melodies are gone, in our grief, in our times of sorrow, we can find strength in Jesus as we lift our eyes to him from whom our help comes. Please welcome Bola Udom as she sings, I look to you. Isolate me 
must be that a cost After giving it my own Winter storms have come And I can't my song After all that I've been through Who on earth will I turn to? I look to you In you I can be strong I look to you I look to you And when melodies are gone In you I hear a song I look to you Losing my breath, the storm of fighting left, sinking to rise one day, searching for that open door. Every road taken led to this race, and I don't know how. Nothing to do but lift my head. I look to you. I look to you. After all my strength is gone, in you. In you I can be strong I look to you for Jesus. Let's try for Jesus. He's the only one that we can look to in this kind of situation. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'd like us to sing a song that is a psalm of um, David. It's a song taken from Psalm 25. It says, Unto you, O Lord, Amen. It's a lovely sound, Sam, and I pray it will help us and encourage us in Jesus' mighty name. Unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul, do I lift up my soul, unto thee, O Lord.
bless your holy name. The King of glory, we bow down before you. The I am that I am, the ancient of days, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. We acknowledge your sovereignty. Our gathering is unto you. You are the God of comfort. Comfort your people in Jesus' mighty name. The next few minutes, please speak to us. Encourage us. If need be, admonish us. At the end of it all, you take all the glory, take all the honor, take all the adoration. And please, let the body of Christ be edified. Blessed be your name, O Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Can we clap for Jesus, please? <clears throat> please be seated in his wonderful presence. Today we commiserate with the entire Theo Duse family, but most especially his lovely sweetheart Maureen, the children Kim, Mose, Omo, Jide, Victor, and their families, and of course all the friends that are here, the relatives, the member of the City of David, the Wisdom Group in particular, on the passing to glory of a husband, father, grandfather, friend, colleague, Mr. Theobald Duse. My prayer is that the God of comfort will comfort every one of us in Jesus' mighty name. He will soothe our pain, wipe our tears away, He's the only one that can give us beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Jesus has promised us that blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We know that weeping can only endure for a night. Joy will surely come in Jesus' mighty name. We pray that laughter and joy marriages and children rejoicing we return to this family in Jesus mighty name praise the name of the Lord for those of us that were here yesterday God spoke to us through our pastor and one of the scriptures that he referred to is Exodus chapter 7 2 and 4 Exodus 7 2 and 4 you see, the Bible encourages us to come for services like this. It says if you had a board meeting or you have a party, give priority to services like this if it clashes. Because when we come to services like this, God calls it a wise man's school. Because here we deal with the real issues of life. That death is part of human experience. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 and verse 27, Hebrews 9, 27, it says it's appointed for man once to die and then judgment. And as we know, an, appointed, an appointment is a designated, pre-arranged, selected time chosen for an event to occur. And every one of us, we have that appointment. It's been selected by God. It's prearranged. And there's no discharge from that wall. Every one of us, is either we die or we are raptured, we must keep that appointment. And we know that life is about times and seasons and purposes under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die. So, this is an appointment that every one of us cannot escape. And when we come to services like this, we hear deep things, things that will make us consider our own end and wisen up, change our ways, apply our hearts to wisdom. My prayer is that God will speak to us today in Jesus' mighty name. Life is brief. Life is alone from God. 
Some have a long-term loan. Some have a short-term loan. But a time comes when the owner of the money, the loan, will come back for that loan which is alive. People of God, we need to realize that this world is not our home. We are pilgrims here. People of God, my prayer is that we will realize that one day, every one of us will return home in Jesus' mighty name. This sermon is broken into two parts. Pardon my voice. Um, my prayer is that in spite of my voice, God will still speak to us in Jesus' mighty name. This sermon is broken into two parts. The first part is to talk about our dearly departed father and husband. And the second part is to focus on us that are alive. Indeed, I would say that almost 80% of the sermon is devoted to us that are here. But we must talk about our dearly departed. You know, many years ago, my father of blessed memory was an archdeacon of the Ankan Communion. He went with my mom to UCH in Ibado to visit a friend that was sick. And as they were walking up the stairs, my mom reminded him that there's another friend here and that they should stop there before they go to the person they came to see. And because my father had an argument with that other friend and they were not on talking terms, says, no, I'm not going. As he said, no, I'm not going. God opened his ears and he heard audibly that Christians must be different. Pastors, very different. Of course, he had to go and see, you know, that friend first. And as God will have it, the next few days, that friend passed on. He was thanking God that, ah, thank God for speaking to me. Christians must be different. And pastors, very, very different. Born again Christians are handpicked by God. We are peculiar people. The way we think, the way we talk, the way we act is supposed to be very, very different from those that don't know Jesus Christ, those who are unbelievers. For example, unbelievers, when they want to announce the death of their loved one, they say, we regret to announce the death of X, Y, Z. But for the believer, you say, with gratitude to God for a life well spent, we announce the passing to glory of X, Y, Z. We are supposed to be different and do things differently. And that is why we're here. Not to weep. We can weep. We can mourn. But the reason why we're here, why many of us are dressed in white, is that we're here to celebrate the passing to glory and the life of Mr. Theo Duzi. Some might be asking a question, why are we celebrating? We should be weeping and rolling on the floor. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning us as Christians. In every situation, he says, give thanks, this is what God wants us to do. He says, this is my will. I know that, yes, you might want to act differently, but my will for this situation is to give thanks. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, the Bible says, as Christians, even though we are permitted to mourn and weep, but we are cautioned not to sorrow and mourn and weep like unbelievers, those that have no hope beyond the grave. Because for a Christian, the grave is not the end. There is a blessed hope that we will meet again. There will be a great reunion. So God says, don't mourn and weep like unbelievers because there is a blessed hope. There is a glorious tomorrow when 
all those that sleep in the Lord will meet again. So, God is telling us that at this service, we should join him in celebrating the life of our dearly departed. Because Psalm 116 and 15, Psalm 116 and 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Our father, Theo, he was born again. He knew God as his personal Lord and Savior. He believed God to the very end. Indeed, one of the last conversations that he had with his wife was that, darling, let me go home. Of course, the wife didn't understand that he was talking about home beyond. He says, let me go home. And for a man to be saying, let me go home, possibly he has started seeing visions of heaven. And he said, let me go home. Because God really celebrates the homecoming of his children. Because once they go home, they are no longer part of the church militants. They are part of the church triumphant. They have fought the good fight. The Bible says that they have finished their course and kept the faith. And the only thing they're waiting for is a crown of glory. They are overcomers. And this has been demonstrated in scriptures before. In Acts chapter 7, 55 to 56 and 60. Acts 7, 55 to 56 and 60. When they were stoning Stephen, the Bible says that he looked to heaven and he saw the glory of God. Normally Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. But when he looked, the Bible says that he saw Jesus standing, giving him a standing ovation. And if Jesus was standing, the host of the billions of angels must be standing, clapping, and welcoming home even a giant, a soldier, a general of the Lord. And I imagine that when a father breathed his last, oh, the heavens stood for him because God gives them a glorious homecoming. I don't know whether it was a chariot of fire you know, and angels that were sent to pick him up. That is heaven's private jet. He was sent to pick up Elijah, chariots of fire, and the angels. They came for him. I don't know what kind of jet was sent to pick up our pastor, Mr. Theo, but I know that his wife told me that when he passed on, he had a smile on his face. And she showed me the picture. Truly, he had a smile on his face. So I believe that, as the Bible says, to be absent from the body is to be immediately present with the Lord. You know, that is 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And Exodus 6, 20, 12, 7. Exodus 6, 12, 7 says, When we die, the dust returns to the earth, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So we can imagine our Father right now Oh, walk in the streets of gold and say how, how I wish I told my children <laughs> and my wife that that gold oh, here is a pavement streets of gold, walls of jasper, you know, no night no weeping, no pain no sickness, that is why we celebrate, because God is celebrating, clapping you know, like all those, all those people that come from battle in those days they'll be on a prancing white heart they will throw a gallant, or when the green eagles, you know, they win a tournament. You know, everybody's out there clapping for them because they have fought a good fight and they have finished their course. So I want us to just clap for Jesus and join God to celebrate this giant of God, this man of God who has finished his course, the son of God, the servant of God. Let's just appreciate God. That is why we are celebrating. God is celebrating. Jesus stands and gives a standing ovation. Christians must be different. Question, why are we different? Why are we celebrating today? Why are we celebrating the life of our Father today? We celebrate because we know as believers that no one can take our lives before our time, before our appointed time. In Job 14, verse 5, the NLT version, Job 14, 5, God says that he has decided the length of our lives. 
He knows how many months we will live and we are not given a moment longer. God knows when every one of us are going home. And he didn't say how many years, he says how many months to let you know that, hey, it's brief. He says, he knows you cannot live beyond the time given to you. You know, Exodus 23 and 26. Exodus 23, 26. God says that he, God, will fulfill the number of our days. All of us have numbers. He says, I will make it happen. I will fulfill it. You won't go before your time. Your life will not be cut short. People might not understand it, but there's an appointed time for you to come. Once the months expire, you got to go. You have to go. It is wise to go. The Bible says that, look, our lives are hid with Christ in God. Even the birds of the air, the Bible says they cannot die unless God permits. He says the hairs on our heads, they are numbered. They are numbered. Amen? They are numbered by God. Of course, not the other hair that they tie on and all Not those um, uh, things. They are attachment, not attachment. But the hairs that came they are numbered. God is so detailed. Nothing can happen to you unless God permits. Even Job had to seek the permission from God before he could touch, I mean Satan had to seek permission from God before he could touch Job. People of God, the only person that I know that asked for extra time, King Hezekiah, he asked for 15 years. God says, put your house in order, time up. He said, God, I'm not ready. I still have this and this to do. He regretted it. He regret, I I'm not even sure he made heaven. There is a perfect will of God and there is a permissible will of God. When God's perfect will says, time up, you better surrender because time up. His guy lived 15 more years. The son that he had was one of the worst kings in Israel. He himself, he even backslid. So once God says, time up, according to the time allocated to you and I. We need to just submit to the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. The Bible tells us in Psalm 1153, He says, God is sovereign. He does as he pleases. You can't question him. Job that tried to question God, God asked him some questions at the end. He could not answer. People of God, God is saying, look, I'm sovereign. I know what I'm doing. You see, we need to realize that how and when we die is God's prerogative. How we die, when we die, is God's prerogative. And his thoughts are different from our thoughts. His ways are different from our ways. His past finding out. John the Baptist, Jesus said that of all men born of women, there is none as great as him. He was a great man, greater than Noah, greater than all those people. But how did he die? He was beheaded. When did he die? Around 33. People will say, hey, this is untimely death. But no, he had fulfilled purpose. He had finished. And God chose how he would die. People of God, at the age of 33 and a half, the billions of angels in heaven they saw their Lord Jesus being whipped. He was being hit in the face, spat on. Blood was flowing everywhere. He was being led to the cross to be crucified. They were looking at God, hoping that God would give instructions because one angel can kill 185,000 people. Not talk of legions of angels or billions of angels. They were expecting God to give the order to go and save Jesus. But the order never came. They didn't understand the wisdom of God, the hidden wisdom of God, that Christ had to go through that pain so that he can understand our pain, that he had to weep to understand what we go through. He had to be crucified on the cross so that all our causes can be broken and destroyed. Because the Bible says that Cost is he that hangs on a tree. He needed to go to hell to release all those captives in hell, to wrest from Satan the keys of hell and death. People of God, he needed to go through that route so that you and I 
can be redeemed. Of course, the disciples could not understand it. People couldn't understand it. But in this dispensation, we now know why. How? God had to go through that situation. God turned his back on him for a season. Why, please God, to bruise his son for our own sanctification and redemption. God had no regrets. He allowed the innocent to die for the sinner. God is sovereign. How we die? When we die? What age? What cause? This is prerogative. He knows what he's doing. People of God, almost all the apostles but one were martyred. Those that were beheaded were beheaded. All this Paul, all these people we are reading about, some of them were quartered. One of them, Bartholomew, he was flayed alive, meaning they disskinned him. He was alive, they took off his skin alive. Some were thrown to lions. Lots of things. They were martyred. We cannot understand this. Elijah, he did not die. He went to heaven in a chariot of fire. But Elisha, who had a double portion of the anointing of Elijah, who did more miracles, he died of a sickness. And yet, years after he had died and buried, there was a battle. And they were carrying a dead man. So they threw the dead man into the grave of Elisha. As soon as the dead man touched the bones of Elisha, he came back alive. We can't understand that. So God is saying, hey, believe in me. I know what I'm doing. You might not understand it. But I took your dad, your husband, at the right time, the appointed time. Forget about how he died. The most important thing is that whether we are alive or we are dead, we are Christ. And we make bold to say that few is resting in the bosom of the Lord right now. Let's clap for Jesus. Let's clap for Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Why do we celebrate? We celebrate today. We are white today. We are rejoicing today because he knew God. He knew Christ before he met death. People of God, we celebrate because his life was profitable to God. He knew God personally. He knew God practically. He knew God directly. That's what the Bible says is the standard in Jeremiah 9, 24, the Amplified Version. He fulfilled destiny. They are saying you must know God personally. You must know him directly. Enough of they said, they said, they said. God wants to have a personal relationship with you. I've had God speak audibly. He speaks. He reveals things to us. He wants to have an encounter with you. People of God, and I know that our Father knew God as his personal Lord and Savior. And that gives us joy. People of God, the first time we met him here in church, I mean, I came to this church in 2007 after Pastor Scott went to be with the Lord. And 2010, when he retired, we were invited to the party that I think uh, Total had for him. And that was my first time of really coming close, you know, to him. And as people have said, very quiet, unassuming. And from the tributes we have had, very honest, perfect gentleman, dependable, high moral standards, ethical standards, integrity. What else do you want to be said about a man? His wife is more chatty. You know, more chatty, which is okay. Amen. Hallelujah. But he was very, very quiet. I, I just imagine how he, you know, spoke to um, his wife when they met in Toulouse in uh, Italy. Was it in French? What did he say? What did she say? But I know that at his last birthday in November when we were there, you know, he was just thanking his wife, loved his wife to bits, thanking him, thanking her. And when we said they should appreciate themselves because in this church, you know, you must say nice things, you must kiss and things like that. When it came to the time of kissing, I think I'm right. He was anti-morin that, you know, jumped at him and kissed him. 
It was a wonderful evening that we had there. People of God, this man was a dependable gentleman. He helped a lot of people. And tomorrow he is a member of the handmaidens of the Lord. And wisdom broke. Mr. Jose's calmness was exhibited, you know, on that day that he had his birthday. People of God, we know that Mr. Duse did not live a wasted life. He surrendered his life to Jesus. He served God in his own way. And it's very refreshing to hear. But even 22 years ago, he assisted one of our pastors in Port Harcourt to build a church. He served God. He did things that matter to God. 22 years ago, built a church in Port Harcourt. People of God, we heard from the tribunes, he reached out to the poor, to the needy. He supported the work of God, gave to orphanages. That's what the wisdom group said. He gave to orphanages. But I won't go out and shout about it. Amen? People of God, we know that believers never really die. Jesus said, in John eleven twenty six, 26, he says, whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believers sleep in the Lord. They don't really die. And everyone that sleeps must wake up. We all slept last night. We are awake today. So as he's sleeping in the Lord on the resurrection morning, he will wake up and there will be a great reunion. The children will see their parents husbands, their wives. Amen. It will be a glorious day. And God says, encourage yourself with this. The grave for Christians is not the end. They are going to wake up even on that day. And you see, this has been demonstrated for the skeptics that say, mm, has it been done before? Are you sure? It has been done before. In Matthew 27, 52 to 53. Matthew 27, 52 to 53. On resurrection morning. You can read it. The Bible says that when Jesus rose from the dead, the graves in Jerusalem, they were split open and the saints that slept in the Lord, they woke up, they got up, they walked around Jerusalem, visited people for 40 days. They ate pounded yam and ogbono soup. Live. Amen? It has happened before. They were in the resurrected body. So it will happen again. We know we will see our Father again. Let's clap for Jesus. Let's clap for Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, part two of this is for you and I. The reason you know that before you were born, there is a book in heaven with God. And everything that will happen to you and I, every day has been written in that book. What God wants you to do has been written in that book. So says Psalm 139 and verse 16, the NLT version. Psalm 139, 16, the NLT version. He says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day passed. That's why I know that nothing can happen to us behind God. Before you were born, everything has been written. What he wants you to do. You need to discover what is written in that book is so important because in that book is written your purpose why you were born your assignment we say we are servants that means that we are here to do something we are pilgrims what did they tell you to come and do here it can't be just to wake up leave marry have children and uh, and uh, and build houses and buy cars and go to heaven no 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 there is an assignment for you the real reason why you were born and of course, the assignment and the purpose is different from our career. I'm talking about your life purpose. Of course, there can be an alignment between your career and your life purpose in which you serve God and humanity through your career. Mr. Jose helped a lot of people through his career. He did a lot of good through his career. But outside that, he supported the church. Outside that, 
he did some good works. So you need to discover. You know, some people have the privilege of being revealed to them. You know, God reveals to them what and why they are here in this world. For example, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 1.5, Jeremiah 1.5, God told him that, look, you can be anything. You can be a doctor, you're a lawyer, but my plan for you, your life purpose, is to be a prophet to the nations. That is your life purpose, and you'll be examined on your life purpose. The same thing Peter. Peter was a fisherman, but Jesus had an encounter with him and said, hey, the plan of God for your life is not to be a fisherman, but a fisher of men. The same thing Luke. He was a doctor, but he became a fisher of men. Jesus Christ, even though he was a carpenter, he had a career, but his real purpose was to save you and I. You need to discover, or else there will be a problem. You need to discover. Our general seer, Pastor Ia Deboe, his ambition was to become the youngest VC of the University of Lagos. But that was not the plan of God for his life. Thank God he had an encounter with God and he discovered the plan of God for his life. Because he came into the plan of God for his life, today, Redeemed Christian Church of God is in 198 nations of the world. And in Nigeria alone, we have 53,000 parishes just because one man discovered his purpose. My prayer is that before you leave today, you have an encounter with God and you discover the real reason why you are here today in Jesus' mighty name. People of God, my own life purpose was revealed to me through a vision in September 1995. Even though I'm a lawyer, I know that I'm called to serve God, to be a pastor. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're not being paid. I still have my law practice, but I know that on that day, God will ask me, I sent you to be a pastor. Did you discover? What did you do about it? So when we come to situations like this, we need to start thinking and asking ourselves, do I really, really know what this is all about? And it's important or else all you live for will be wasted. You know, even if you live to 100 years or 200 years here, one day you will stand before God. You will die. Methuselah, 900 and whatever, he died. So it's not the length that matters. It's do you know what is written in that book? Because your life must be profitable to God. If they send you on an errand to go and buy bread and you bring yam, that is a no-no. Your life must be profitable to God. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, 2 Corinthians 5.10 and Romans 14.12, and Romans 22, it says, one day we must all appear before God ah, on judgment day to give an account of what we have done in this body, whether good or bad. On that day, they will open that book. We sent you to go and do, 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 do. What did you do? You have to give an account. On judgment day, you must render an account. People of God, that is why you have the book of life. Your name must be recorded in the book of life when you give your life to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says, unless you are born again, you cannot see or enter into heaven. So, is your name in that book of life? And there is the book of works. It records the works that we do. Everything that we do is being recorded in that book of works. Every one of us will have it. It says on Judgment Day, Book of Life, they will check your name. Is it here? When do you give your life to Jesus Christ? Yes, okay. Book of Works. And we'll be judged from the Book of Works. People of God, we came to this world without nothing, and we are going not taking anything. The only thing that follows us in Revelation 14 13, the only thing that follows you are your good works. What have you done for Christ? What have you done for God? It is the only thing, and it's the only thing that follows you because there is a Book of Works, it's being recorded. Every day is being recorded. People of God, Matthew 7, 22. Matthew 7, 22. Jesus says that some will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In your name, we have cast out devils. In your name, we have done many wonderful works. But we say, depart from me. I don't know you. There's a difference between wonderful works without a relationship with Christ. That is philanthropic works. There are a lot of philanthropies around. You build schools, you build, but if there is no relationship, those guys, they did what appears to be 
good works, casting out devils, did many wonderful works. But there's a difference between wonderful works and good works. Wonderful works are done without relationship. He says, I don't know you. I need to know you for me to accept those works as good works. My prayer is that today God will speak to us in Jesus' mighty name. People of God will be judged from the book of works. Is your life profitable to God? These are questions for you and I. Have you discovered your purpose? Are you living your life for God? Are you living in sin? Have you lied this year? Because the Bible says that all liars are going to hell. Is there unforgiveness in your heart? Is there pride? Is there fornication? Is there adultery? You know these sins. People of God, the way we live our lives will determine whether on that day we wake up to damnation or we wake up to heaven. That's what the Bible says in John 5, 29. It says some will wake up to eternal life, some to eternal damnation. I pray that when we die, when we wake up, we wake up to eternal life in Jesus' mighty name. People of God, God said I should tell you and draw your attention to something as I run to a close. You know, one of the most subtle and lethal sins that can take one to hell is not so much the sin of commission, what you have done. It is the sin of omission, what you have not done. It's subtle. And it's taking a lot of people to hell. That's the story that I will end with. In Luke 16, 19 to 31. The story in Luke 16, 19 to 31 of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was very rich. He was famous. He had investments. He had homes all over the world. He had a wonderful wife. He had children. He had five brothers. He threw parties. He was very busy. His business was doing well. He had shares. He had stocks. Great family. He lived in comfort. The Bible did not say he committed any sin, like adultery or pride. It didn't say he committed any sin. He did not steal. He did not murder. They didn't talk about unforgiveness. His sin was a sin of omission. He saw Lazarus, a poor beggar, lying at his gate each time he drove out and came in. And probably in his heart he says, ah, I will have to sort this guy out tomorrow. I will give him a tip tomorrow. But he never did. He ignored him. Lazarus was hungry. Lazarus was thirsty. He was sick. He was naked. He was homeless. He was needy. This man ignored him. The Bible says in James 4.17, the NLT version, it says in James 4.17 that it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's the sin of omission. You know what is right to do. Pay your tithes. You don't do it. Give an offering. In proportion to the blessing of God in your life, you don't do it. Feed the poor. You don't do it. Focus on heavenly agenda. You don't do it. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. You hoard. Hoard more than is needed. The Bible says, Lazarus died and the angels of God, they came for him. Read it. They came for him. And immediately he found himself in Abraham's bosom. He says, the rich man died and he was buried. The way they described their departure was different. One, angels came. The other one, buried. Big party, big occasion. But he woke up in hell. Huh? Lazarus woke up in heaven. The rich man woke up in hell. Darkness, worms eating him. Gnashing of teeth, regrets, pain. He looked around. He saw a lot of terrible people. Abominable human beings. Demons, witches, wizards. Unrepentant, wicked people. Liars, cannibals, terrorists. Osama bin Laden. Notorious killers. Fire, unquenchable fire. Worms eating them. Bottomless feet. He was thirsty. He was in agony. He said, what am I doing here? 
What am I doing here? I'm not supposed to be here. What did I do? Huh. But the question is not, what did I do? Is what did I not do? What does it profit a man? To gain the whole world and lose his soul. Today, the question is to us, are you born again? When were you born again? Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. Uh -uh. Nicodemus said, what do you mean born again? Does it mean I'll go into my mother's womb and be born again? He said, no, that first one that all of us have is being born of the flesh. The one I'm talking about is being born of the spirit of God. So for you to make heaven, you must have two birthdays. The one you celebrate every year and then the day you were born again. That you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Born again. When were you born again? Who was there? It's very important. Did it involve a public confession? Or was it private? Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32. Matthew 10, 32 says, Whoever shall confess me before men, I will confess him before my father. But if you deny me, you are shy. You are ashamed of me. You cannot confess me before men. Then when we get to heaven, when you want me to say, ah, daddy, he's one of us, I too will turn my back on you. So what kind of confession did you have? Who was there? When was it? People of God, hmm, you must be born again. How are you living your life? Is your life profitable to God? Are you giving priority to the things of God? Are you supporting the things of God? Are you rich towards God? What are your good works? What are you ignoring? What have you seen or heard that you know you should do that you're not doing? What is lying at your gate? Have you led anybody to Christ? Your life, your character, can it attract anybody to want to know the God you serve? Have you discovered your assignment? When you stand before God, what will you say you achieved for God? What have you done with your life? Jesus told us in Matthew 25, 41 to 46, that on judgment day, he will ask purely CSR questions. They revealed to us, his conjure, that on judgment day, this is what I'm going to ask you. This is what I'm going to ask you. I was hungry. You gave me no meat. I was thirsty. You gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. I was naked, you did not clothe me. I was sick, you didn't visit me. I was in prison, you couldn't care less. He says, all those that cannot answer, <laughs> with facts and figures, they go to hell. CSR. Taking people to hell, he has told us. So examine your ways. Is your life profitable to God? Do you care about all these things? We've had the life of our daily departed. He cared. He helped people, the needy, the poor, orphanage. How about you? That is what matters. People of God, in this church, we are building the Trinity Towers across you just here. We're almost finished. Just to support CSR works across the globe with the rental income. That's why we're building. Are you part of it? In your own church, are you part of your building, building fund? What are they doing? This mission, the Redemption of God, in the last three years, we have done 900,000 projects in Nigeria alone. We have spent 25 billion naira doing health, education, all kinds of things in, in the last three years. In Lagos alone, we have 30 daily feeding centers. Of all the dialysis machines that we have in Nigeria, our church has supplied 25% of it. Next week, we are going to Abuja to set up another eight in Bauchi, three. We have intensive care units. We are doing the work because this is what matters. You need to connect. If you make God your purpose, God will reveal your purpose to you. You need to. You can't just live life anyhow without thinking of the end. What matters is what have you done for Christ? My prayer is that, hey, when you remember today, you remember the good things that are said 
about Mr. Duse, he's finished, he's gone. How about you and I? How are you living your life? People of God, for those that don't know Jesus Christ as a personal and a savior, those that are not filled with the spirit of God, when they die, it's goodbye because we won't see them again. They go to hell like the rich man. He went to hell. But for those that sleep in the Lord, we can say good night because we know they will wake up on resurrection morning. And that's why today we are confident to say good night to our daily departed because we know we will see him again. He knew the Lord. Today, God is giving you a second chance. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You cannot make it on your own. By strength can no man prevail. All your good works that you do, those wonderful works without relationship, are filthy the rags before God. It doesn't count. It is time for us to be paying attention to the things that matter. Acts 4.12, Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only the name of Jesus. So long and short of it, today, are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you have two birthdays? When is the second birthday? But God is giving you a second chance. As a story of Albert Noble, he opened up newspapers one morning. He saw his obituary. Huh? So he said, let me read what they said about me. They said, he's the doctor of death. Apparently it was his brother that died, but they thought it was him. Because he's the inventor of dynamite. So they gave statistics of how many people dynamite had killed. He said, wow. So this is what they're going to write about me when I die. He says, I must change my mind. So he set up the Nobel Peace Prize and started giving people prizes for the cause of peace. Today, when you hear Albert Nobel, you don't think of dynamite. You think of the Nobel Peace Prize. God gave me a second chance. As all eyes are closed, today, God is giving you a second chance. Are you prepared to meet with your God? Do you know when your time is up? You don't know. But when your time is up, will you be able to stand confidently before him and say that, yes, I'm a good servant. What did you serve? Where did you serve? Will he say, depart from me, you wicked servant? Or will he say, oh, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the world. It's only you that can determine. How's your life? Please, I beseech you by the message of God. If you know you don't have this second birthday, second birth, or you gave your life before and you fell back into sin, no unconfessed sinner can make heaven. I'd like to give you an opportunity to do it again or do it for the first time. So you know, you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you want to discover purpose, so that whenever time comes for you, you have to confidently stand before God and give him an account of the good works that you have done. Then, I'll pray with you. You can put your heart, hand on your heart. I won't tell you to come out. But at least there must be some public show that, yes, I belong to Jesus. There's a register in heaven. They want to write your name in that book of life. So if you know you haven't done it before, or you look at your life and say, I know I don't have a personal relationship. I know I don't have a direct relationship. I know I don't have a practical relationship with God and I want to have it today. You are the only one we are speaking to right now as all eyes are closed. Just put your hand on your chest and we will pray for you. There is nothing to be ashamed of. I did it many years ago. Many people have done it. Theodice did it. Just put it and we will pray. We will pray. We will pray. Just put it on your heart and repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. I know I'm a sinner. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Please forgive me my sins. I plead the blood of Jesus to wash me clean of every sin I have even done or omitted to do. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Write my name in the book of life. Make me brand new and help me in my work with you. If you said that prayer, welcome to the family of God. You are now born again. If you don't belong to a Bible-believing church, join one and God will help you to walk righteously before him. And when your own time will come, 
that will be rejoicing in heaven over you. God bless you. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the living Jesus. After such a word and lives that have been touched, I believe the Lord deserves another clap of rain. Thank you, Jesus. It's time for us to pray for the family. So shall we, um, family, rise up right now. Mrs. Maureen, children, every member of the family. Please rise up as we pray for you. And I want you all to stretch your hands towards the family. I begin to thank God for all that he has done. Let's thank God because our God is faithful. He is indeed the God of all flesh, the one that is the resurrection and the life, the one that has kept this family till now, the one that made sure that our brother, father, grandfather, husband has gone to be with him. Let's thank God because God is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He's the resurrection and the life, the one that has given our brother the gift of eternal life, the one that has written our names in the book of life. We thank God because indeed is one that will continue to keep this family. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. Spirit of the living God, comfort this family in Jesus' name. Comfort us all. Father, we know that you are the one that knows the beginning from the end, the one that has ensured that everyone under the sound of my voice shall make heaven. Father, we declare that every one member of this family, mighty God, shall have a divine encounter with you for the rest of their lives in Jesus' name. Father, we cover this family the blood of Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord God Almighty, that every word of hope you have given to them shall be permanent in Jesus' name. We declare that every one of this, every member of this family shall make heaven. That because our brother has slept in the Lord on that resurrection morning, we shall see him again in Jesus' name. Father, we declare that all that has been said today concerning the works of our hands towards your kingdom, Father, we pray that we sh our works shall follow us in the name of Jesus. We declare that, Lord God Almighty, none of us shall miss, mighty God, such a great salvation. We ask, O oh Lord, that because you are the father of the fatherless, the husband of the widow, we ask that your peace will be upon the Duse family in Jesus' name. Lord, we declare that, Lord, everything that you have purposed, because you work, make all things work together for good, Father, let everything work together for this good of this family. Everyone, mighty God, that has indeed seen that you are a good God, that has seen that you are a God, mighty God, that works, makes all things work together for good, Father, we declare that this family, O oh Lord God Almighty, shall have, mighty God, the things that money cannot buy. Father, that the name of the Duse family, mighty God, shall continually speak for them. That everyone, everything, everything they lay their hands to do shall prosper. That indeed, mighty God, with long life, you will satisfy every member of this family and show them your salvation. Father, indeed, because we know that you are good and your mercies are new every morning, we declare that joy shall come again upon this family. That Lord God Almighty, you shall indeed give every member of this family a new anointing of joy. That Lord God Almighty, you shall indeed help this family. Help them to pass this trying time. Help them, mighty God, to even have, mighty God, even an experience with you through this event that will change their lives permanently for good in the name of Jesus. Father, you are good. Your mercies are new to us every morning. You are indeed faithful. 
we know you are there faithful. You have said that we have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children beg for bread. This family shall never beg for bread in Jesus' mighty name. We declare that, Lord, they will not lack any good thing. Father, we ask that all the children of this family, mighty God, shall be remembered by you. Father, we thank you. We can only thank you because in everything you have said, we should give you thanks. Lord, we appreciate you. And we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. For the rest of this event, we declare that, Lord, your spirit, mighty God, will take absolute control. Thank you because indeed, mighty God, there shall be testimonies for this family. Testimonies that indeed you have been good and that indeed you are the one that takes care of those, mighty God, that indeed trust in you. Father, we give you praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the adoration. Thank you, King of Glory. And whenever we hear from the Duse family, it shall be good news. In the name of Jesus, blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone who has come uh, to support the Duze family at this time. You are welcome to the City of David. This is a parish of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. This is where the love of God reigns. This is where dreams come true. This is where legends are born. This is where tomorrow's testimonies are manifest today. Uh, prayer is that the Lord will continue to be with each and every one of us and uphold us and keep us through trying times at all times, always in Jesus' name. So I'd like to welcome all those who are worshiping with us online from all over the world. Thank you for joining us and for supporting the family. I'd like to give a special welcome and appreciate uh, Pastor Itwa Igodalu, the senior pastor of Trinity House Church. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Continue to uphold you and anoint you afresh. I also would like to appreciate uh, Pastor Ifai Ade Farasi, First Lady and Senior Pastor of House on the Rock Church, uh, who joined us at this service. God bless you. I just had to step out and like to appreciate Pastor Rono from this present house church. Thank you, sir. God bless you, sir. I'd like to appreciate other pastors. Uh, ministers who are visiting and who have come to support us today. Uh, especially, I appreciate our pastor, Pastor Ido Willi Omade, uh, Father in the house. God bless you. Thank you for the word. I appreciate Pastor Shiju Ili Omade for all the support and um, being a blessing at all times. I appreciate the pastors who are also here from the city of David, Pastor Femi Sanusi, Pastor Ayolokum, Pastor Hyacinth Thaneke. Pastor Chuka, Asie Bunam, Pastor Ayo Fashaki, thank you. God continue to bless you all. I appreciate the choir, uh, ushers, and all those who are working behind the scenes. Indeed, continue, God will continue to uphold and keep us all in Jesus' name. At the end of the service, as uh, we take the recessional hymn, the order of recession is that uh, the ministers will go first, uh, followed by the remains of our brother. Theoduze, and then the family would follow. Um, and these times, also because we are trying to avoid clustering and crowding, the ushers will guide us so that we live in an orderly manner. Praise the name of the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says, To every thing there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. For our husband, our father, our brother, our friend, Theobald Musa Duze, it is time to say not goodbye, but good night, because we are confident that we shall meet again on resurrection morning at the foot of Jesus. So please welcome John Viv and Duchi as they sing, time to say good night.
Please welcome to give the benediction, Pastor Itwa Igodalo. Amen. As we close the service, in faith and hope in Jesus Christ, let me thank my friend and my brother, Pastor Iliomade of the City of David Church, for giving our chairman, our husband, our friend, such a dignified farewell. I think we should give the Lord a round of applause. Let's just bless his name and thank God. You know, when Pastor Agu lost his wife many years ago, there were sounds of rejoicing in heaven because the saint had risen triumphantly. I think we should put the devil to shame and give the Lord another round of applause and just bless his name and just thank him 
that in spite of everything, we remain thankful, we remain triumphant, we remain grateful, we remain eternally happy for the life of a distinguished man, a celebrated man, a wonderful father, a brilliant gentleman, a man who did his best, who came, who saw he conquered, and he left many, many garlands and took many stars. Amen. God bless you all. I want to assure you that the feeling today is indescribable, but day by day, bit by bit, season by season, it will get better. And the God of all comfort will comfort you. Shall we rise? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Father in heaven, we thank you for the life and the times of your son, Theobard Musa Duze. We thank you, Lord, for the time of his birth. We thank you for seeing him through 68 years, keeping him, directing him, strengthening him, and definitely not putting him to shame. We thank you because we know and we are sure that he has gone to be with you. And by your grace and your mercy, we will see him in the eternal life. Therefore, Father, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Look over this family one more time. Bless and direct them. And let it be well with them. In the name of Jesus Christ. I commit you into the hands of the mighty Savior. The one who is sure to steady and, and strengthen you. The one who will make his face to shine upon you. And the one who will be gracious unto you in Jesus' name. And make the face of the Lord shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he give you peace and give you joy. And may his light eternal and his strength everlasting and his peace unshakable and his joy overflowing continue to be yours now and forevermore. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. Hark, hark my soul. Angelic songs are swelling. Over earth's green fields and oceans wave beat shore. How sweet the truth those blessed strains are telling of that new life when sin shall be no more. Our processional hymn is on page seven of our programs. Thank you.